Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar today. My name's Nick Smith. I'm Regional Sales Manager for Genetech for UK and Ireland. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about how you can reduce your risk and avoid GDPR penalties, uh, specifically how Microsoft and Genetech can help with that. So what I want to talk to you about today really is what, what the GDPR and ICO Data Protection Act means for you, um, specifically the challenges that uh, you face with leg legacy video management systems, with the mechanisms and the processes you have in place today when dealing requ with requests, and how a digital evidence management s system can help you um, increase efficiencies, make the whole process far more um, far more cost effective and how that can help you comply with GDPR. So becoming GDPR compliant is a way of doing business that, that, that's got to be embedded in multiple areas of a business or an organization uh, and it does take multiple steps to accomplish. There are six steps um, that have been identified. Uh, these include appointing a data protection officer, mapping your data processing, managing risks, implementation and documentation. Now, if we start with the appointment of a data protection officer, this doesn't apply to all organizations, but when we are looking at specifically local government, um, there are certain conditions listed under Article 37 of GDPR that do make specific reference to public authority. These being, um, if processing is carried out by a public authority or body, um, except for courts acting in their judicial capacity, or well, number two, the core activities of the controller or the processor consist of processing operations which, by virtue of their nature, their scope, and the, their purposes require regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale. So when we're talking about public space control rooms uh, specifically, both of those uh, references within Article 37 apply. So therefore, within a public space control room, you would need to appoint a data protection officer. Number two, we look at the data processing. And this is where you need to map your data processing. So again, it's, it's defined in Article 4, Section 2. And processing means any operation or set of, of operations which is performed on personal data or sets of per personal data. So here you really need to identify, identify the key elements and describe the information flow. So, so when you collect the data, what do you do with it? How, how do you manage it? You need to map that out. The third uh, point on the road to compliance is prioritizing actions. So where, where you have collected that data, identify and prioritize the actions you've got to take to comply with GDPR and other privacy laws. Number four is managing risks. So conducting a data protection impact assessment for high risk activities. Then you need to implement your processes, which is number five. And again, these are procedures and internal policies for security breaches, um, the management of access and erasure requests, data modifications, etc. Et um, we can obviously help you along with that. We've got um, some, some ver very nice, uh, easy to use um, services, which will allow you to do this. But what we need to do is the key bits are making sure that we get consent. So providing clear and easy acceptance and withdrawal. So data signage um, helps with that. Privacy by design. Obviously, we, we, we have to make sure our, our systems are secure by design, but now we need to need to implement privacy by design. And that include that that means that we need to protect the data uh, we're, we're by using methods such as pseudo anonymization, encryption methods, uh, and GDPR ready solutions. We have to look at breach notifications. So under the data protect, uh, GDPR, now we have to communicate a data breach within 72 hours. We have the right to access, so clear methods on accessing data, uh, subject access requests, etc. Um, providing a self-served system, uh, what is referred to as a digital kiosk, uh, and having a structured and commonly used format. And lastly, the right to be forgotten, the ability to have a system that does allow you to remove uh, the personal data of, of, of people that where you hold that information. 
Number six is the documentation. So again, you, you really need to create and maintain documentation of all these steps. Um, ideally, digitally, currently I know they're very much analog based, so that they, they, it is uh, normally paperwork in a rim binder. But we really need to be looking to move away from that and ensuring there's a full audit trail, both from request and the issuing of data to um, to either individuals or stakeholders. So how do we then respond to video requests after we've got May the 25th here, it's tomorrow, I can't believe it's come around so quickly, but you know, we, we, there's, there are some significant changes um, with the introduction of GDPR tomorrow. So councils will now um, be presented with strict rules for providing information to citizens and police in a timely manner. Um, this includes providing data within a 30 day period. This is specific to subject access requests where previously it was 40 days. And no longer be able to request a fee. So where previously under a subject access request you could um, charge a £10 administration fee, you can no longer do that. There are also higher fines for non-compliance. So where uh, a breach is not reported within 72 hours and or it's found that um, steps were not taken to ensure that systems were GDPR compliant and that uh, the protection of personal data wasn't um, wasn't implemented, then there are two tiers. There's 2% of your uh, global revenue or £10 million pounds, or for more um, extensive breaches, more serious breaches, it's 4% of global turnover or £20 million. Pounds. So the uh, fines that are now going to be implemented for breaches or where um, protection hasn't been implemented properly are, are serious. You must protect the identity of others in video. So where we have a subject access request, we need to ensure that we are redacting faces. That's blurring out the faces of people who are not making that request. Even when we are issuing video to stakeholders, again, we need to ensure that we are protecting the privacy of the people who are not involved, who are not, um, not, not the subject of interest when we're providing that data. An electronic submission form is recommended. So where we're looking again at um, both the subject access request or, or the request for footage, but more importantly, when we're then managing that for that digital evidence and we're providing it, it really needs to be in an electronic format where possible. Um, it provides us then the ability to audit things a lot better um, and also keep a better trail of what's going on. So I want you to think about how, how do you currently approach the situation when it comes to responding to video requests. So I'm, I'm aware that within public space uh, control rooms that actually subject access requests are probably the smallest amount of requests that you get. Uh, most requests are from stakeholders, whether that be the police service or uh, other departments within uh, that organisation. But ensuring that the smooth operation of a city, town or borough council, um, it's not an easy task. So as, as, as local governments try to keep citizens and cities safe, you need to do so by maintaining a balance between accessibility and security. So overly restricting access or inv invading personal data can lead to, to backlash from, from the general public. So being too accommodating can also result in cyber threats, uh, fines by the ICO or public display of sensitive information, uh, for example, on YouTube. So I can imagine that when you do respond to video requests, especially when you do get a large amount, you know, that limited staff due to cutbacks, austerity, it does, it can create a delay in a response if there is any response at all. And I'm sure that most, most if not all, are responded to. But it does, uh, because of staff shortages, it, it does mean that sometimes those responses are delayed. Um, fees can be charged as well to offset budget constraints. I, I am aware of certain councils that do charge the police um, for processing and providing that material. Outdated systems increase delay costs and paperwork. So again, because it's a manual process at the moment, the request is a manual process. It normally um, normally involves filling in of a form. Um, and again, the whole audit trail as far as issuing that data to um, an individual is a, is a manual process. And again, it, it involves more paperwork. 
So again, this just increased delays, costs, paperwork. You know, it, it is a very um, painful process at the, at the moment. So just want to run a quick poll um, to understand how much time in total it takes for you to fulfil a video request from the moment you receive it. And we've we've provided three options here. Um, hopefully nobody is um, that nobody's expecting an option that's more than five days. But the three options are less than a day one day, two to five days. So if you wouldn't mind just letting us know kind of how, how quickly you do respond. Just looking at two to five days is, um, is, is the common one, which is, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it could be improved on, but like I said, there's a lot of work to be done and we are short on people. So hopefully um, th there's a better way of doing that. So more than 50% of companies uh, affected by GDPR will not be in full compliance. So that source is from Gartner, um, which seems crazy that at this point, you know, we, we, we are looking at such a high percentage of companies that will not be in full compliance. Um, we're also expecting that now that GDPR uh, has been in the public forum for quite a while, that a large number of citizens will likely exercise their right to access video that they appear in. Um, I think with the Data Protection Act, maybe people didn't really understand so much, but I think with GDPR, because it has been in the public limelight, I, th I, I would expect more members of the public to be requesting that information, and we believe that it's going to be about 80% of citizens. So what's the cost? What's the true cost of sharing this digital evidence? So, um, I mean, we, we do have two different requests here. We do have the request from stakeholders. We also have a subject access request. But if we take um, a subject access request, you know, we, we've got the labor costs. So we've got the time that it takes for somebody to sit down, search for the video, uh, find the video, uh, redact the video. And now typically most systems especially if they're old analog legacy systems. Um, they don't have the ability to do that at source, and therefore that needs to be done by either a third party or a third party bit of software, which, it, again, has some cost. It's then burning that evidence, whether it's burned onto a DVD or onto a, um, onto a, a memory stick. There's then the shipping costs to get that data out to that person um, from a subject access request. So we've got the cost of a registered package, which is on average around about £8.50 £8. to send that. So we believe just on a subject access request, it costs on average £100 to respond to a single request. But now if I talk about um, requests from stakeholders, specifically the police, you know, those costs can increase significantly because, you know, there, there are certain costs um, – that might not be a direct council cost, but they are a public purse cost. So that police officer where traditionally, and again, we were talking cutbacks here, would have been a local police officer. Now, because of cutbacks, they tend to be regional officers. So they're coming from stations or locations that are further away. There's the cost of them having to drive that vehicle and, and, and um, get to your location. Um, so you've got fuel costs. You've also got time. There's then the cost of that officer sitting down with a member of staff in a control room identifying the video that's required, which can sometimes take quite a lot of time. You've then got the cost of um, of burning that video off and then providing to that police officer again on a on a on a, um, a physical format, whether it be on a DVD or a USB key. And then the cost of that officer going back to their location um, and again there's fuel. And then typically they'll they'll need to come back. So maybe they sent they've forgotten or there's another police force that will want to get involved. So therefore that, that could be um, multiplied a number of times. So I believe that on a, where it's not a subject access request, actually the, the, the average cost is probably quite a bit higher. There's also some hidden costs. Um, and again, where you've got legacy systems these hidden costs can be very much about the evidence getting into the wrong hands or the evidence being lost completely. And one of the real challenges when you've got um, footage on physical media is it can get lost. It can be left behind somewhere. And these costs can include, you know, dismissals of a claim, lawsuits from victims because um, the, either the information got into the wrong hands or, or the information wasn't there or available for courts. There's a public relations crisis. Um, so video getting leaked on the internet. 
Now, I know our use of body-worn cameras in the UK is very much on the increase, um, but in the US, there's a far higher use of body-worn cameras. And you only need to go on YouTube to and type in body-worn camera footage um, leaked to see how much footage has been leaked onto the Internet, um, which, which obviously we need to get away from. And then you've got re- unresolved crime. You know, there's a real cost when that data, that evidence is no longer available. Um, there's there, there's a cost as far as the, the case being thrown out of court due to lack of ed- evidence. There's the emotional cost to the person who, who the victim, um, specifically when they find out that, that the reason was because that evidence has been lost. So just want to n- run another poll. Um, and in this poll, I just want to ask how much you think it costs to process a video request from start to finish. So again, we've got three options. Um, less than £100, about £100, or more than £100. Uh, so be interested to know what you think. Um, yeah, and unsurprisingly, I believe that everybody's come back with more than £100. But I, I kind of agree with that, especially if you are dealing with the police a lot. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, there are those hidden costs as well, you know, time, um, fuel, So I just want to talk about some some instances, previous historical incidents where fines have been applied due to specifically the loss of evidence, uh, which has been provided on physical media. And I think that's the big risk here, because as a data controller in your control room, once you issue that data, that video, to either the police, another department, or, or, or individuals, it's out of your control. And once it's out of your control, then um, you, you, you are no longer in control of what happens to that data, and, and that's a problem. So if we have a look at this, we've, the, the first example is um, we've got AMI Island. Uh, they were fined £150,000 in 2015. Uh, Because they lost some devices with personal data on it. Um, The council lost three DVDs related to a nurse's misconduct hearing, uh, and it contained confidential personal information and evidence from two vulnerable children. Uh, An ICO ICO investigation found that the information wasn't encrypted. So that's the £150,000 fine there. And then in 2015, the ICO fined South Wales Police £160,000 uh, for DVD data that was lost. Um, the ICO said in the report on the case that the DVD contained witness evidence relating to a sexual abuse case, as well as other information and material. Uh, and it was left unchecked and unprotected and went missing. Fortunately, the DVD was actually found left in an unlocked drawer um, it, where it was taken and stored in, 19, in 2011. Uh, and it was only discovered three months later after an office move. Recently, in 2018, the ICO fined Humberside Police £130,000 um, after discs containing a video interview of an alleged rape victim went missing. And then in 2017, Greater Manchester Police were fined £150,000 after three DVDs containing footage of interviews with victims of violent or sexual crimes got lost in the post. So this is pre-GDPR, and these are significant fines, and, and you know, it's, it's going to be... Uh, the fines are going to be a lot heavier post tomorrow. But this just shows why encryption is so important, why putting unencrypted video or any uh, unencrypted data that's of a personal nature on physical media is a risk. So if there's a better way of doing this, if there's a way of not providing this footage or the evidence on physical media and retaining the control of that data, then that risk is mitigated because you're in control. So I want to talk to you about a specific uh, use case. So a a Genetech customer, um, Decorum Council. The challenges they had was that that, that, that their main customer was the police uh, service. Now, because of restructuring I talked about and cutbacks on resource, most of the officers were no longer reg- uh, were no longer local; they were regional officers. So historically, local officers required footage. They filled in a request form. They spent a bit of time with staff. Um, but because it was local, it, it 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 was a much simpler process. When it became more regionalised, the process became a lot longer. Um, so that officer would phone up. 
they would either fill in a form or they would be emailed a form, they'd fill it in and they'd send it in. Um, but again, it was a manual process. That officer would then come into the control room. They'd spend typically a day with an operator identif identifying the data they required. Um, a lot of the time, they would actually take far more data than they really required. The problem with that is it meant that you were having to export a lot more data and sometimes even having to use multiple disks, so multiple bits of media to, to issue that one. There was extensive paperwork, um, and it was all manual. The amount of ring binders that they've got in that office is ridiculous. But there were also gaps in the paperwork because, um, you know, the, the paperwork was really all about the request, but also the issuing of the data. And so there was a whole middle period that was um, very much missed and lost because the analog system they had there meant there was no way of being able to trace what was happening with that data. There were the time travel and the costs, and there were no real audit trails. And again, once they issued that data, it was very much out of the, um, out of the control room's control. So there is a better way. There's a better way that exists. Um, a digital evidence management system um, is, is a way of storing evidence and allowing that to be shared with a click of a button. And it allows it to be shared amongst multiple users, multiple stakeholders, um, without them actually having to leave their, their, their uh, office or their location. We believe that this can save at least £100 per case uh, and reduce that cost to the public purse. So how, how does this make things more, more efficient? Well, it allows us to collect multiple formats of evidence. I mean, we're talking specifically today about video, but this will allow you to actually upload any evidence from any kind of uh, format. So that could be uh, witness statements. It could be um, video. It could be uh, any other digital format that you need to bring in. But it's also not specific to a particular manufacturer of video system because every manufacturer has their own codec. So again, it allows you to bring in multiple different types of evidence and formats into a single point. It allows you to convert that video automatically. So again, make it so that it's easy to be able to view. One of the big issues about having multiple different systems is you have to have multiple different players. If you don't have that player for that system, you cannot see that video. Well, by having a digital evidence management system, it will decode that video so that regardless of the format or the proprietary format it's in, you can view that video easily. Again, when we're looking at protecting uh, individuals, so we're protecting the privacy of individuals who aren't the subject of interest, we can easily and quickly redact video by yourself. So it doesn't need to go to a third party. So that could be re redacted either by the case holder, the person who creates a case and is managing it, or it could even be redacted by the person who is uploading video. So that might be a third party. It might be a Starbucks uh, coffee shop or uh, any other retailer that's got some video that has captured that incident uh, that you haven't got a view of, a view of. And it very easily allows you to share video with anybody else involved in a case. So. As an organization, you create the case, you own the, you own the majority of the video, um, you're the controller of that, and then you can share it with other stakeholders, whether that be the police, uh, different departments, or, or individuals as part of a subject access request. And that's done very easily by that person or those people being provided a link via email that then allows them access to that case, depending on, uh, with the access being dependent on the access rights that they have. So this allows you to reduce your risks. Um, so at all point, you can track user actions. So from creating the case from the subject access request or the request for information, that is automatically audited within the system. It's stored electronically. You can then limit the access to information. So you can define what user or that what access a person has to that information. And it will also audit that um, access so you know who's accessed what and when who's uploaded information and when, and what information was uploaded. You can store video for only as long as you need. So in the case of a subject access request, where traditionally we would um, we would issue that DVD to that person who's made that request, and they can then keep hold of that um, DVD for as long as they need. Using this system, they would be provided with a link. It will then provide them with the ability to view the video of them, uh, with all the faces of other people who aren't that person redacted, 
but you can then set a period on it, a, a retention period or an access period to say that after 14 days, they no longer have access to, the, to that. So you've complied with the subject access request, but at the same time, you've retained that control of that, um, of that footage because you're not issuing it out there and you've limited the amount of time it's available to a person. So from a subject access request, that, 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 makes, uh, that reduces your risk. And then when we look at third parties, we look at stakeholders. Again, we, can, we only need to store it for as long as we need to store it, so we can set retention periods. And we can set retention periods on the type of category of case that we create. So it's flexible on how you do that. And we securely store and share the digital information, so the digital evidence. Everything's encrypted. So it's encrypted from the point where we upload it, from where it's stored, and even, even from the point where somebody accesses that video, all of it is encrypted to ensure that privacy is protected. So what do you need to really look for in a digital evidence management system? Well, you need to look at something that facilitates collaboration at every stage. The point about when we're working on a case and we're looking at providing evidence there are multiple stakeholders potentially involved. Like I said, you've got the data controller. That's, I mean, we're talking about um, public space control rooms here. They're the data controller. They have some evidence. They may need some evidence from a third party, whether that be a private um, organization. Again, they become a collaborator. And then there may other be different, there may be different departments. They become collaborators and then the police. So it's, you have to look for a system that's flexible and will allow you to collaborate without any uh, restrictions on um, networks or uh, provide access rights to uh, persons requiring access to this system through Active Directory without having to input everybody's details um, as and when they join or leave the business. And you need to make sure that it increases flexibility to move into the cloud. If it resides on the network, you're always going to have the political issues about allowing people access to that network. The IT departments will not be very happy if you uh, want to request that members of the public, the police, or even potentially other departments have access to your network. So by moving to the cloud gives us that flexibility. So I just want to show you a quick video on, on, on how we can reduce that risk um, and increase productivity by using our digital evidence management system, which is called Clearance, Genetech Clearance. So when you respond to video requests or working on investigations, you, you do require that collaboration between multiple stakeholders uh, before you can share your, your security video. Um, you really need to redact it to conceal people's identity uh, and other sensitive information. Um, and this process can be very time consuming and expensive. But with our product, you can quickly redact video in-house. And what this is going to show you is how easy that is to do. So after uploading your clip, and you'll see in a minute how we can upload a clip, it's literally drag and drop your video clip. Or it, like I said, it can be any, any evidence at all. But in this uh, example, we're going to use a, a video clip. What the system will do is actually detect all the faces that are within that clip. And that allows you very easily to select the images or the faces that have been detected that you are actually interested in. So the idea being that where you, have, where you haven't deselected any other faces, their faces will be redacted. They will be completely blurred. You can then convert that image so that you get that redaction. And that's a... And that makes it an extremely quick and simple process to redact video. Now, sometimes it might not pick up some, some faces, especially if they're too far away or the, the, the camera resolution isn't high enough, so it doesn't quite detect those faces that are just off, off uh, at the back of the scene. So what you can do in that scenario is manually drag the redaction window over those faces to ensure that you're capturing everybody in that scene. So what you end up with is a very easy, very quick to use um, footage with the privacy protected for the people who are not involved within that incident. You, before that case is, once that video is created, you then be able to review it before adding it to a case, just to make sure that you're happy with everything there. So again, and as you can see, it's a nice, simple process. So where normally responding to video requests where the video needs to be redacted would take hours to complete, even for shorter clips, 
Uh, with Gentech clearance, you can protect people's privacy and collaborate with ease. So just going through some of those steps, um, uploading and editing video, it is a simple drag and drop. If you don't do drag and drop, you can use it in the same way as you use Windows Explorer. You can click open and it will ask you the location of the video or the documentation you want to upload. Um, and then you just select your local file and from that point you can either redact it or you can leave it as it is, as you see fit. If you decide to redact it, once you click the redact button, it will then bring up that video footage automatically then uh, identify all the faces that you can detect within that clip, so within the period of clip, and then you will then um, select the image or the face that you don't want redacted, uh, which at that point will then make sure that that person is completely visible um, and all the other faces are blurred out. So if we look at the next slide, You can see here that it's redacted all of the faces that it detected, but at the back there you can see there's a green box uh, for somebody it didn't detect, and at that point all you do is as that person moves through that video, you just drag that box across it and that makes sure that their face is completely uh, obscured. So the next step, once you've loaded all your footage within this service, within this case, um, you can then start to invite people. So we can invite users to view that case. It could be either, um, and again, it, they, each user will have different permissions as to what they can do. So with the police, they will probably have the ability to pretty much view everything and also potentially download. But there might be other stakeholders that only have the ability to view certain videos or certain documentations, documentation, but can't download it. And you can basically set that up through permissions. But it's simple to add people. It's as simple as putting in their email address uh, and then saying invite. Um, you select their uh, their permissions as what they can do. They get an email with a link and it allows them to log on and then um, access that data. Again, all of this is constantly being audited. So everything we do here is being audited within the system so we know who's uploaded what, who's been invited to what, what access rights they've got and what they've done and when they've accessed it. So again, we're just making sure we comply and so we know what, exactly what's going on. So it's very, very simple to do. We then start to look at what, what is the security behind this. So when we're inviting users to view our video and securing these investigations. So accessing it is very much role-based. Your permissions are based on your role and what you need to do. Um, the actual communication with the cloud-based surface is completely encrypted. So, um, you know, you, you can be safe that that data uh, is not accessible to people who may, for any reason, decide they want to try and accept it. The data is also encrypted where in, when it's stored. So not only through the transmission process, the communication process, but also when that, all of that data is, um, is stored on some storage in the cloud, it's encrypted and it's pseudo-anonymized as well. So we, we use what we call encryption at rest uh, with redundant storage. You've then got claims-based authentication, again, to ensure that, the, 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 that the, those requesting access to that information um, have the ability to do it through digital certification. Um, and we've got a full audit trail to make sure that you can um, at any time report on who's done what and when to, again, comply should you have a breach. So just having a quick look at the security overview. Um, and how we can grant permission, different levels of permissions. Again, these are giving a very simplistic what you can do. These are on a file by file basis, or they could be on a case by case basis. But what can you do when you access the access the uh, the case? And again, we're maintaining a chain of custody with audit trails, and that is really really important. So again, when we look at adding the extra layer to ensure we're complying. We can specify retention po policies. We can have um, retention policies across the board, so it's a generic retention policy for any data that's stored, or it could be based on 
specific types of category of incident. So again, here you can see on aggravated bur burglary, arson, assault, we say never delete. But you can specify um, periods. Again, you'd probably have a category in there which is a subject access request, and you'll have a standard, what you define to be um, the period when that, that uh, information is available for and retained. We then have a really nice feature within the system, um, which is a map search. So what this allows you to do is wh when we create a case, um, we have the ability to put certain data against that case. So who, who started the case, um, an incident number, a record number, um, the type of, the type of incident, the category of incident, but more importantly, the location of the incident. And that can be done by typing in a postcode and it will give you a drop down postcode lookup and you can identify the address or the nearest address where that incident happened. We can then type in a description of the incident, but more importantly, keywords. And this is, this is a metadata search. This is very much like searching through, through Google, through any search engine. Um, what it allows you to do is, is actually start to interrogate the information you've got. So if you have a series of BMWs stolen, you can type in, type in black BMW. And what it will do is it will show you on that map every instance where you've created a case involving a black BMW. So it will give you a better situational awareness of what kind of cases you've had over a period of time. Um, it will also show you the amount of cases, uh, and you can click on any case within that um, on that map, and it will open that case up. It also can bring over where you've got IP cameras, body-worn cameras, mobile phone footage, which can all be loaded up as footage within this. Um, Body-worn cameras and mobile phone cameras hold metadata of where that footage was taken. So they know exactly the GPS coordinates of where that footage was taken. Most IP cameras now have the ability to put that geolocation into the camera so it knows where it is. What that means is as you bring that footage into a case, it will actually plot on that, on that map where that footage was taken from. So not only do you have a visual idea of where the incident were, uh, actually started, but also uh, a visualization of where that footage was taken, which can be useful to understand how that incident played out. So it's a nice, powerful tool to be able to go back and actually um, interrogate the information you've got, see if there are any patterns, but also get a feeling and an understanding of exactly, you know, kind of wh where are your cases and what kind of cases do you have. So going back to Decorum Council, um, so we saw what the challenges were, which I believe are probably <laughs> you can all relate to, especially if you work in a public space control room. So since they um, since they started using um, Genetech clearance, th they found that it's it's improved things significantly. So they've got no more shipping or travel time. So that's time and costs. The police officer no longer has to get into a car. They don't have to come over to the control room, and they don't have to sit there with a member of staff anymore. They make the request. That member of staff then finds the footage they need. They upload it to the service to, to clearance, creating a case. They then invite that officer. That officer then can access it. They can review it. And then if they do need anything else, they can then speak to that or, or contact that uh, control room operator again. But it's a nice, simple, easy process with completely reduced cost. You're always in control, or decorum council are now completely in control of their data with reduced risk. Because they have a full audit, they know exactly what's happened. So even if the police officer does download that data and does lo lose that data because they can do it, the fact is that the council have done everything they can to protect that data. Because it is stored in the cloud, they're not issuing it on physical media, um, and they do have that full audit trail. It's far quicker and more efficient for the staff. They, they, they really have found this a far, far easier process. The problem they found when police officers do come in, that they do spend a lot of time with them. Um, when now they've got this system, the, the police officers are having to be a lot more specific about what they're after. Um, there is no more paperwork because it is all digital. So they don't have to keep filling up ring binders and finding place for that and, 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 and making sure that records are kept because it's far, far easier to audit. So the Quorum Council um, have found that the system has vastly reduced their costs, vastly reduced the amount of time spent with um, third parties going through information. It's reduced their risk and made it a far, far more efficient and, in their words, uh, a far slicker system. So just kind of looking at the key bits of GDPR for digital evidence management system. 
So we're looking at Article 15. We've got the right of access by the data subject. So GDPR uh, will provide a solution to that for subject access requests. You know, I've been through the process, but it does mean that it's very, very simple to be able to provide that information and stay in control of that information and protect the privacy of people who are not making that request. You've then got Article 30, which is records of the processing activities. Again, by employing this type of system means that you do have a full audit trail. So you understand exactly who's accessed and why they've accessed that information. You're in full control of that data and the processing of that data. And, and, and by also, um, by being a data controller, you'll always be that data controller. At the moment, you're still that data processor. By moving the, moving to a cloud-based service actually makes the cloud-based service provider the processor. So you are kind of offloading some of that risk. You no longer become the processor of that data once you put it into the cloud. And then when we look at Article 5 and GDPR principles relating to the processing of personal data, and again, it's ensuring that the appropriate security of the personal data is implemented, which includes protection against unauthorized or unlawful processing uh, and against accidental, accidental loss destruction or damage. To, uh, so to do this, you need to use appropriate technical or organization measures. So that's where, again, by having that, that role-based access, so you can only access the data uh, if you have the authority to do so, by ensuring it's always encrypted in the cloud, in transit, at rest. Um, we do pseudo anonymize that data as well, so another layer. And then um, by ensuring we have that full audit trail does mean that we are going towards a full compliance with GDPR. There are certain things that are outside of our control. You know, we can't control the operator and we can't control the person who eventually receives that data and downloads it. But what we are doing is ensuring that we have uh, we've put all the right processes in place to minimize the risk. So the partnership with Microsoft um, we are sat on the Azure platform, the Microsoft Azure platform. Um, so that means that the security and privacy is built into that platform. Uh, it, we have, we are a gold partner with Microsoft. We work together at the very highest levels. And we do that because we want to ensure that the, the highest level of protection, encryp encryption, and availability is, is available, is there for our customers. Security is implemented at every single phase of development. We take security very, very seriously. Um, and so it is implemented at every single phase of development. Uh, Azure Security Center makes Azure the only public cloud platform to offer continuous security health monitoring. So again, it's about that availability of systems and making sure that um, it's always available to, to you as, as the client. So just a quick word on Genetech and who we are. So at a, at a glance, we are a, a global provider of IP-based uh, security uh, solutions. We support serve clients of all sizes in multiple verticals uh, and our mission is very much to build solutions that help our clients master their environments and protect the flow of everyday life you know it's it's core to our business and i think you'll find that you know looking at our solutions portfolio that's exactly what we do is about improving the everyday so to sum summarize you know really more than 50 percent of companies affected by gdpr would not be in full compliance consider your costs uh, we, we, you know, we, we're saying at least £100, and I think they are far higher. And then there's the hidden costs, you know, from a PR perspective, um, you know, just, just from a whole uh, privacy perspective. And think about how we can help by providing a digital evidence management system, which requires nothing installed locally. It's a very cost-effective system, and it can reduce your risk, improve your productivity, and reduce costs. Um, and that's exactly what Genetech Clearance can do. So next steps. Um, you can book a demonstration with myself. Um, so my email address is on there. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. So uh, there are probably a lot of Nick Smiths on LinkedIn, but type in Nick Smith Genetech, you'll be able to find me, and you can contact me that way. Uh, by all means, you know, I can come to your office. We have a facility in Reading. Uh, we can take you to Microsoft in Reading um, for the demonstration. We're also running a 45 days free trial so again if you get onto the um, the that, that link there um, it gives you the ability to start that trial straight away and you can try it for 45 days and I'm sure you'll be very impressed we've also got some resources that are available so if you want to have a little read through um, 
on our website, take a look. We've got a good white paper there. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, if anybody's got any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, and thank you very much for your time today.